Would you consider yourself like a coordinative, skillful person? No, I you're, wouldn't. You're kind actually. of a nerd. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a nerd, very much like you. Yes. Yeah, I've never been an athlete. We are not coordinated people. Yeah. Now, I have an interesting question for you. Chicken or the egg? Chicken or the egg. Are we not coordinated because that's just who we are? Or are we not coordinated because we just never did that type of training? And so I think this would apply to most people. And I think it's really interesting because when we look at different brain regions that respond to skill-based exercise, aerobic exercise can affect those regions. For example, you know, aerobic exercise uh, in cardiorespiratory fitness has been related to like whole brain gray matter. Improvements in you know, volume in the hippocampus, the frontal lobe, the basal ganglia. But it's interesting, there's some research showing that motor, this neuromotor fitness addresses the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, sort of the second brain in the back of your head there, it's a very dense area. Uh, but aerobic exercise is not. Hmm. And so I think the question is, did we just never train that, right? Because I, I, I don't know if this was your experience, but being the fat kid, I never played sports because I didn't play sports. I didn't learn a lot of skills. And it's like that area of the brain has a lot to do with cognition and emotion. So it's like it, and we dismiss ourselves from those modalities because of like avoiding an embarrassment or we're not good at it. And we think we shouldn't do things we don't do. But I really do believe that it's just a lack of training. And so the, the idea of being coordinated and skillful, it's just like having muscle mass. It's, yeah. it's either trained or it's not. It's like cardiorespiratory fitness. It's trained or it's not. Yeah. I think you got to get those like reward pathways lit up at just the right sort of sensitive period yes. in, in your upbringing, mm -hmm. you know, where you then seek out, you know, those kinds of uncomfortable things. But yes. like you, you know, you pass a threshold where you're like good enough, where yeah. it's not that discouraging, you know, those first couple of times that you maybe don't do whatever it is that you're doing so skillfully. Right. But um, music is another, um, it's not really related to, to, well, I guess it is kind of related to exercise. Music is another one of those examples for me in my life that, um, you know, I didn't grow up musical, but I mm -hmm. decided actually kind of late in the game, like halfway through college to become a musician. I was like, I'm going to do this. There's That's enough awesome. people out there that are musical and that sing mm -hmm. that they're, this isn't like some kind of magic thing that you come out of the womb being able to do. There's got to be course. a method here. Yep. And so I dedicated like a significant, you know, I was like practicing for hours and hours and hours a day to like get to do this, you know, and learning a musical in instrument we know is one of the best things that you could do to it's build It's very your, helpful for cognitive reserve. Yeah, yeah, to build your cognitive reserve. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's just... So I completely agree with you that um, you really can accomplish whatever it is that you set your mind to. You just have to you just have to set your mind to it. That's right. And I think, you know, the, the neurobiological underpinnings or, or rationale for doing, doing neuromotor fitness, I think, is there. It's these, you know, improving the, the structure and function of the cerebellum, the basal ganglia. There's these reward pathways that you're talking about. There's these flow states that we get. There's this idea of evolving challenge over time. And so when you described your jump roping, it started as cognitively demanding just for the basics. That meant you were in the cognitive phase of motor learning. So Fitz and Posner in like the 1980s put forward this, this model of motor learning, these stages of, of skill learning. The cognitive phase is the most awkward, frustrating, challenging uh, stage. But that's where it has the most cognitive load, specifically the most working memory demands, short-term memory demands. Because you're just like, it's so, it's such a conscious effort. Yes. Right. You're trying yeah. to remember the steps and this and the coordination and it takes a lot of focus. Yeah. But I would say that's a very cognitively, it's almost like a nutrient density equivalent. It's a very cognitively dense stage of learning. Wow. Right. And usually that's the stage where people get discouraged hmm. and they stop or they never do it again. For example men dancing in a group exercise class. They're in that cognitive phase of motor learning. They struggled because that's the struggle phase. They struggled, had a negative experience, got embarrassed, didn't do it again. Or you did a sport and you didn't do that well. You didn't want to play because you didn't do that well. Now, the next stage is the associative phase where you're starting to proceduralize some of this. And then the phase after that is the autonomous phase where it's almost automatic. And as long as you keep challenging yourself and bringing yourself back to that cognitive phase of motor learning as you're doing with these more complex patterns, that's what's likely to mediate improvements in executive functions uh, via skill-based pathways. And those pathways have been found to be stimulated through uh, even theater arts, per performance arts, dance, uh, you know, all sorts of skill-based training sports, for instance, all mediate cognition through these skill-based pathways. And so going back to that cognitive phase of motor learning, I think because of that, losers win. And that's where it's okay to suck at something. Mm. And I, I've worked with a lot of clients and patients 
I'll give the example of a male that doesn't want to dance because they've never found themselves to be successful in that way. Um, but we've actually, you know, for some of our patients, we have neuroimaging. And sometimes they're reporting cognitive issues and mild cognitive impairment, but in their hippocamp, uh, their hippocampal volumes are normal, but their cerebellar volumes are not. This is why I asked the chicken or the egg. And so I'm starting to see this pattern more and more. People that don't do skill-based activities with atrophy of the cerebellum, I'm like, that's probably really important. So that's why I think it's helpful not to just focus on the hippocampus and aerobic exercise. There's these other domains that are really important for other parts of the brain. So if you want a whole brain exercise program, you got to focus on all three.